Sega. Age of Charlemagne is the brand new campaign pack for Total Tiller focusing on the great general himself, the father of Europe, Charlemagne, who was the founder of the Holy Roman Empire. It covers Western Europe and features eight playable factions, all new unit rosters, all new building trees, all new tech trees, which have lots of beautiful artwork in there as well. It is a fantastic campaign pack that's out there. With the themes of Attila being so focused on the death and destruction and Attila the Hun and all that, we want, we've been moving forward to our campaign pack sort of representing the rebirth of the world, if you will. So the last Roman is all about the last chance of the Romans to recapture the old empire, and now Age of is when the medieval nations are being born. You're starting to see nations like England and France and Germany start to emerge, and new great kings taking the nations forward. To help show this progression, each playable faction has a kingdom forming event it can have. So for example, if the Kingdom of Mercia takes all the regions of England, it can then transform into the Kingdom of England, and it gets a brand new effect bundle and a new name on the campaign. And this is true of every faction. Uh, Charlemagne even gets two, where you can go from the Kingdom of Charlemagne to the Kingdom of Franks, and then to Holy Roman Empire. When, when, when it came to the map boundaries, we, we looked at the full extent of Charlemagne's empire. Um, and possibly, if he wanted to go further, then areas of the map where he could have gone. Um, so, for exa example, we um, we included Britain and Ireland, which he never historically went to conquer, but they were involved in the whole Charlemagne world, so we included them as well. Um, we didn't include Africa because it's not really a massive part of the Charlemagne story. France is the centre of the Charlemagne map, so we wanted to make France the right size and everything else around it had to fit in with that. Um, and I think for the scale of the Charlemagne map we, we, uh, we, we spent quite a long time making sure that it was right and that it was large enough to feel good. Because it's the main focus we wanted it to feel really good with moving armies around France, moving armies in and out of Italy and stuff, so we, we, ch we chose the scale because, yeah, it was, it was the biggest we got the biggest map for the right scale we could get, I think. I did a couple of different things on Charlemagne. Um, the, one of the biggest ones was the, the new victory conditions and objectives. So for, for main game Attila, we had a system um, which was kind of based around a series of historical events, the birth of Attila um, and the arrival of the Huns and so on and so forth, um, which worked really well for that, but it, it, didn't, <clears throat> it didn't really have any relevance in the period which our game was set. So we tried to think about a way to um, to kind of make uh, victory objectives that were a bit more flexible and catered to the player's playstyle a little bit more and allowed them to achieve a victory in a way that they hadn't previously been able to in a Total War game. So basically, um, all you need to do to win <coughs> is to earn a certain number of Imperium points that will take you up to a certain number of Imperium. So five Imperium level 5 for a short victory and Imperium level 7 for a longer victory. Um, <coughs> and the, the way that you earn Imperium had been a little bit um, a little bit tucked away um, in the base game, uh, so we kind of brought that to the surface a little bit more, and um, we, we put it on buildings, we put it on technologies, um, and <clears throat> and you also gained it by conquering regions. So basically, what this what this meant was that you had three uh, different paths to, to gaining Imperium, and you didn't even need to actually conquer a settlement if you didn't want to. You can actually win the game just by building buildings that give you Imperium and researching techs that give you Imperium. Um, so we thought that that kind of allowed players to pursue very different playstyles and still get that reward of having a victory. Uh, so War Weariness is a new feature in Age of Charlemagne. It's essentially kind of re uh, representing that your people eventually will grow tired of war. So you can't sustain war forever. Uh, your people and your troops will eventually grow tired. You'll start taking penalties, things like lower unit morale, um, public order penalties and even it gets really bad the loyalty of your generals will begin to drop uh, so there's a number of ways that you can kind of counteract war weariness obviously if you have a sustained period of peace that'll start bringing it down rather rapidly uh, making peace deals with uh, kind of various enemies if you're at war with multiple people will give you like a big drop um, uh, also you can do things like bring all of your troops home that'll help if you're in kind of a really dire situation 
Yeah, so we've got a, a lot of new unique story events in Shalomai, more than we've ever done before. Um, they're kind of based on history, so if you're playing as the Vikings, for instance, you're going to see yourself kind of going to England to raid some villages, maybe ultimately uh, ending in the Danelaw. Um, they're quite influential, these events, more than ever before. Um, you can see things like regions changing hands and borders changing, things like that. So, so Charlemagne has some pretty cool event chains. Um, you'll start off with your brother Carloman dying at some point, and that's kind of going to kick everything off. Then you're going to be kind of deciding how you want to go about maybe taking over Carloman's lands or maybe doing something else. Um, ultimately, you're going to end up towards the end of your campaign, maybe trying to become Holy Roman Emperor. Um, you'll be having a lot of interactions with the Pope, as Charlemagne did throughout his lifetime. Um, so the Pope's going to play a large part of Charlemagne's story chain. Uh, Campaign-wide changes, personality traits. We redesigned the personality trait system, and we tried to make to give the players extra feedback regarding the personality traits. Uh, Campaign-wide changes, wise. The, we try to imitate a little bit the medieval diplomacy, so AI marriages became more important in Charlemagne. The AI will offer marriages more often, marriages will give a huge diplomatic boost, but divorcing someone will give a huge diplomatic penalty as well. Also, the AI will never raise settlements, it will tend to occupy settlements, rather than sack or loot them and players from the original campaign will find some differences regarding how the AI treats sieges meaning that the AI will tend not to assault settlements and will, not tend, will tend not to sally out basically we wanted sieges to last longer in, in Charlemagne so in Charlemagne we have two basic personalities, one offensive and one defensive and upon, of them, upon them sits see the personality traits. The personality traits exist in the main campaign as well. We try to make them more interactive. For example, we have a trait called the loyal trait, which means that an AI which is loyal would be very hard to gain as an ally, but that once you manage to do that, then it will be very faithful to you and it will set as a high priority to help you if you are in war. Since in order for traits to become more interactive, they became more complicated as well. In order to counter that, we have added extra feedback. So now when the player hovers over the diplomacy screen and he hovers over a personality trait, he will see the traditional description, but he will also see in green and red text some gamey description of what the trait does in game terms. So if you hover over the loyal, you will see He's very hard to gain as an ally, but if you do, he will help you a lot. Thinking about Charlemagne, it was you know it's the early medieval period, so we thought we'd do something like really kind of hardcore medieval style. Uh, so uh, you know we looked at uh, um, a few of our past games, and, and we looked at which unit icons have been most successful. So we thought that the best icons that we've done uh, recently are probably Shogun 2. So when we looked at you know what, what's really good about them is that they, they really look in period and they also are um, really readable, you know, with, with flat colors and outlines and things. So we looked at what the possibilities we could do in the early medieval style. So I looked at a lot of uh, parchments um, ancient uh, texts like you know old Bibles and illustrated Bibles and Book of Kells and all that kind of stuff um, and we found uh, a few nice pieces in a, in a very similar style that we thought this would work so so we then chose that as a style but it wasn't entirely straightforward because um, just like the unit models in game the the unit cards are constructed from components so not only did we have to define the style of it we also had to had to create a, a system where we could, uh, uh, in Photoshop, decide what all the different components are. So we've got torsos, heads, weapons, armor, etc. Um, and and then we had to write some scripts to to read in the unit database into Photoshop 
and then for Photoshop to automatically construct all of the unit cards based on all the components. Alongside the release of Age of Charlemagne, we've done a brand new update to the Grand Campaign, which has introduced the White Huns as a playable faction. These are situated in the east, near the borders of the Sassanids, and have lots of lovely bonuses for beating up the Sassanids and other eastern factions. The uh, they've got a brand new unit roster, and all new stuff to do with them as well. Uh, yeah, the hardest campaign in Charlemagne would be legendary difficult difficulty, playing as Westphalia, have to declare one every faction, you can't liberate other factions either, you must take and control every region you conquer. Try and win that. That's good. That's good. <laughs>